and we are recording and let right. So you want to start off with a quick background about who you are, what you've done, just for everybody watching. Uh, yeah, so, so we're on, we're recording. All is good right now? Mm -hmm. Awesome, man. Uh, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm at Lattimore, and what I've, what I've done, I've done a few things uh, in my life. Most notably, the kind of the thing that I've built everything around. I used to fight, and, I, and from that fighting, I, I try and draw insights and talk about things. And I built a blog around that, my life and everything. And a social media presence that kind of piggybacks off of that. And I use that to accomplish a variety of goals. Right now, the biggest one is, is I'm working on a new book and a new course. And the book is going to be a mainstream publication because I've built up the following to kind of be able to make that move, which is nice. And, and of course, you know, a few courses. I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily a fan of the course culture, so to speak, but I am a fan of teaching and, you know, taking what I know and, and delivering it. And in pure education, like I'm not taking something and I'm like, oh, OK, you know, here's how you make money. And that's how I make money. Like, nah, you know, my course is about writing. Uh, the next one's about, I have a membership site for guys struggling with pornography addiction. And, and I think the next one that can come out is be vices in general, guys with, with big issues, with problems and issues, uh, trying to overcome any habit. So uh, those, those are really passionate spaces to be. One, because they naturally overlap with kind of my mindset about discipline. And also, because they're near and dear to me because getting those things under control helped me get my life under control so I know what it's like to not have control yeah that makes sense so I know you obviously you just sort of said about you know you're trying to basically help people overcome some of the biggest vices in life one of them that you mentioned is obviously pornography addiction uh, I know that you in the past have also had some issues with alcoholism, so you kind of I believe yeah. you've gone completely sober now. Is that completely sober, or is that just completely so? It's completely sober. It'll be it'll be seven years on uh, the twenty third of December. So, I've been been completely sober. Well, well done for that. Uh, it's obviously kind Thank of a big man. thing to overcome. Um, what kind of sparked that like desire almost to stop drinking? What was that sort of turning point for you? Oh. Uh, Oh, the big thing for starters was I didn't like my life. I didn't like the experiences I was having. I didn't like the person I was. So that really motivated me to make make some changes. Uh, but but more than that, I, I had some goals. Finally, for the you know I, I thought not for the first time in my life, but but so, but the most significant goals. It was a very ambitious undertaking. When I got sober, I had just enrolled in school. I had just enlisted in the military. I had just turned professional as a boxer. And, and I had just met my girl, who I'm still with now. And, and these were, and I, and I felt like this was an opportunity to, to turn and make a big decision or uh, to make, make big progress in my life. And so I did that. And and the results have been great ever since. I mean, like like it hasn't been like the linear path to success because that doesn't exist. But uh, I have gotten better every year, and it's largely because I have control and discipline of myself, and that's that's what I needed to get. Mm, no, I completely understand what you're saying because like I a few years ago didn't like who I was. Maybe it's, I wasn't quite in as big of a pit as you were, as I would say, but I definitely didn't like who I was and kind of had to work to make those changes. And it's kind of at one point, which you may have experienced, you're kind of at a fork roads where you can either go down the route of like self-improvement like you have and like I kind of have, uh, or you can basically, what a lot of people do is go down the route of almost nihilism where they can then decide, right, well, I hate myself, what's the point? So from your perspective, how do you kind of, what's your advice for people trying to overcome that kind of decision? So how do you stop people going down that nihilistic route? Uh, you know, I can't, I can't give a person something to care about. I can't make them care about life. And those are, those are two really important things. You, you have to want to be something. And you have to admit 
that you want to be something. Like it's not. I, I think a lot of people have a big problem admitting that they want more out of life, and so they they never get it, right? Because they're not even gonna try. Because trying is scary. Because you can fail when you try. If you just if you just float around, uh, you don't have to ever worry about dealing with disappointment. Anyone who's never dealt with disappointment isn't, isn't trying to become something better. But when you when you decide that you're not scared of the intent, you're not scared of trying, then you can make a big difference in your life. That's just what I believe, and that's what I've observed. The people who who don't get right ever uh, and go down that road of nihilism, they they decided that. They, they, they trying is scary because nothing just happened. Uh, they don't have the grit and growth mindset. It's just not there. So it happened or it didn't, whatever, it didn't happen. Okay. Uh, now, if it had just happened, that'd be okay. They'd be great. They, they'd talk about it and be fine with it. But, but it's scary because that intent to try and know that you may fail. A lot of people ain't built for that. So I would say if you're, if you're looking to make that decision is you can't be afraid uh, to get to, to fail, you can't be afraid to fail. Pretty much, as cliche as that is, you can't be afraid to fail. Mm, yeah, and that'll make all the difference. Hundred percent. I think the biggest change that I've made in my life is seeing failure as success, almost. So even if you do fail, that means you're just one step closer to being successful, basically. Um, and you're completely right. You know, if you see failure in that way, don't aren't afraid to fail and see it as a good thing, almost. Yeah, and you know, I, I've I have learned. That what matters is is the ability to confront the unknown with a solid attitude. If you can do that, you know you're going to be okay. But part of that attitude of confronting the unknown, is, you know, that's based in it's based in not being afraid of what can happen. If you're afraid of what can happen, the uncertainty is going to terrify you. You're not going to be able to act without a guarantee. But if you can act without guarantees, if you can make moves, if you can, if you can basically bet on yourself because you don't know what the outcome is. For sure, you're betting on yourself. Then, then some bad things will happen, but I guarantee a lot of good things will. And when the bad things do happen, they're not going to be that bad. Yeah, or at the very least, you'll be able to overcome them because you'll put in your faith. In Absol- yourself. Absolutely. Hundred hmm, percent. So obviously, you, you, like you said, you've kind of had uh, a lot of challenges to overcome in your life, especially early on, and you've kind of developed into this successful person in various different areas of your life. Uh, one thing that you talk about on your website is you've lived four different lives. How did that kind of idea and inspiration to talk about these four separate lives come about? Did it just sort of come to you over time, and you've kind of always known this, or? Um, a, a bit of a, a bit over time. I've always said I've I've been really fortunate to live a few different lives, and that's given me a lot of a different perspective. But when I um when I sat down to write that, I, I just I felt like that was the best way to describe what I felt was was taking place in my life, which was really uh, taking the best parts um, from each life and learning from the worst parts and using them to to improve myself, using them to not backtrack, you know, because what good is learning lessons uh, if you don't if you don't um, do anything with them? You know, I think a lot of people kind of touch the stove and they know the stove is hot. And they just stay away from the hot stove. But what a person like me tries to do is I try to I try to get another stove that's not so hot. I try to lower the temperature. I try to do something so I can get through it instead of just being avoidant. So uh, I've, I've done that with each of those lives and each of those experiences. And they are vastly different. And I've been fortunate enough, in the, in the weirdest way to call us fortunate, uh, to be born at the bottom of society because that gives you pretty much nowhere to go but up and there's a lot of different things you see as you are um, ascending and 
fortunately for me, you know, I, I had I, I, I had a few things that allowed me to see things, and I got to experience a very different life than the one I was was brought up with, and it was great. Obviously, like you said, your four different lives are completely different. You know, like you started off kind of you know li living like you say at the sort of like the bottom of society um, and then you kind of moved and you've been in the army you've you know been a heavyweight boxer so you've, you've experienced like so many different things um, obviously with the army and heavyweight boxing that is very physical I know there's an element of like the mental side to it but it is a very oh, yeah. physical thing and now you you know you've got a physics degree uh, it's physics isn't it yes yeah uh, you're obviously you know, playing chess. You you're an author, which is obviously pretty much all mental. So how do you make that shift of going from your life being primarily physical and physical conditioning all the way over to basically the opposite end of the extreme? I, I don't see a difference. <laughs> I think that's the big thing. I don't see a difference um, because it's all it's all forcing and facing off against the challenge. When you do that, um, it's when, when, you, when you're when you're involved and then facing something challenging, yeah, um, it doesn't matter whether it's physical, mental, or emotional. It's still gonna have the same effect on you. You're gonna have to become someone different. You're gonna have to uh, humble yourself. You're gonna have to uh, be receptive to information and energy that perhaps you were not before. Uh, no matter what, you're going to change. And ideally, that change should be in a positive if it's to, to overcome. Uh, a challenge and so that's the way I look at it I mean I, I'm just you know fortunate enough I suppose fortunate is probably not the best word um, I guess astute enough to realize that one needs to work their body and their mind and I never wanted to be just a smart guy I never wanted to be just an athletic guy so I've got to be oh, one second it's it's early here on this <laughs> or earlier I've gotten to be both, which is something I strive to be, to try to make sure my mind and my body is sharp. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know, I, I completely agree with you. It's important to have both the physical and the mental sharpness. Um, so in your opinion then, obviously you've heard the expression, uh, jack of all trades is a master of none. I personally yeah. don't really like that expression because it, it kind of belittles people for trying to be a jack of all trades. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think go down the route of being just you know, good at everything or kind of specialise and be a master of one? Um, I think it's impossible to be the best at any one thing. And people aren't meant for specialization. We do so many different things. I, I think you need to be uh, you need to be proficient on quite a few things. Now, I think there comes a point. I think that advice is applicable uh, maybe to an older generation where it, it paid to be, and, and it still pays to be the best at, at things. Let's not get that twisted. But I think there was not nearly as much reward because the jobs were so much more... Um, worse more specialized so you needed to be more specialized before but now you know if, if you have you know if you, if you have an understanding of networks and programming and you can you can write and you also happen to speak another language i mean that that opens up a huge world for you that did not exist even 50 years even 20 years ago well that's well, so much 20 years ago that was 2020 but uh, but maybe 30 or 40 years ago because now the world's so interconnected and our technology does so much for us that really i think the people who have, who can synthesize information and put together talent stacks they are they are one step ahead of a lot of other people and so i think the advice at one point was sound but the world has so fundamentally changed that it is it is no longer advice I think you want to give someone to to make moves and to excel in the world. I think you want to teach them uh, there's a there's a base wide set of skills they should pick up. Now if they choose to dive deeper, that's that's their own decision. But I don't think it's it's a mandatory uh, anymore at all to. Form 
for a person and go, okay, I need to do, I need to spend all this time doing this, you know. And on top of that, there's, there's a lot of time, man. Like, there's a lot of time. Mm. Yeah, no, especially when you live in a world where you can learn pretty much any skill for free online, like 100%. Um, you know, all you need to do is watch some YouTube tutorials, you know, go online, do a, even a free course if they have them, and just learn a skill. Yeah, exactly. I'm, um, I, I think that uh, self drive, the ability and self, the ability to self start, that's, I mean, if, if there's one thing you want to do, but that's like a meta skill, right? Uh, uh, if there's one thing, though, you need to like focus on is the ability to do that because the world is out here. All the knowledge you want is for the taking. And if you ain't, if you're not going to do anything with it, then, then you're in bad shape um, because someone else is going to wake up and they're going to see all this. Thing. I mean, free. We're not even talking about the stuff you can pay to learn. Free. Free. It's all free. And anyone can learn anything now. You know, it wasn't like this. Like, like you look a bit younger than me. How old are you? 20. 20. Oh, right. So you're, you're 15 years younger than me. When I was 15, it was not just so when you were born. When I was 15, it was not uh, possible to do what we can do today. A person can go to can can become proficient in anything, and not just like proficient, like oh, I said I can do this. Like no, they can take like legitimate courses and be certain certified and specialized. Uh, the world is experiencing a fundamental shift in this regard, and that uh, education is. Well, it, it's um, it, it's starting to be valued correctly, because right now what they what they've done is they made the university system, uh, this this big giant safety net, and and now they now it's worthless. You know, it's not, it's it's no longer a thing that anyone can like, uh, reasonably afford based on the return on investment. But if you want to now, if you want to jump ahead, the people who, who stack books, who learn, who put things together themselves, they go build businesses, they they learn languages and all. You know what blows my mind? Just for an example, I know I know I told you sometimes I, I sometimes ramble on, but you know feel free to roll me in. But uh, it's an example. You know you can go pay like fifty thousand dollars for a degree in a foreign language. And I know people who have got, I know a person who's got a degree in Spanish and French. Meanwhile, you can get on italki. You can get on italki and pay somebody $20 for, for a session. Or I'm in a course right now for $1,000. They have the 30, it's, it's uh, four times 30, 120 hours, right, of, of instruction, real world talking instruction. And that you know, and how, how are you going to compete with that? That's just one example. You can, you can, anyone can learn to code and learn computer science, and then demonstrate it because that's a meritocracy. You just show up and go, I can do this. Look what I've done. Here's my portfolio. World's changed. Uh, we were brought up to believe the world was going to be one way, and now it's completely other. And a lot of people ain't they're not coping with that shift, especially people in my age range. I think you guys are going to be fine. Uh, but there are a lot of you. Know, I, I I don't I don't know what the kids are talking about these days. But uh, what I do know is that a lot of people my age are like, we can't find jobs, and I'm like, well, that's because you don't have any skills. And we we shifted to a skill based economy. If you ain't got the drive to start something on your own, uh, and you don't have the drive to go learn something on your own, don't expect somebody to just give it to you anymore. Other days is over. Yeah, hundred percent. Like. I know a lot of people my age, especially with me, like I've got that kind of automatic process of, oh, I don't know how to do something, I'm just gonna Google it or just YouTube it and then I can learn how to do it in five minutes. Um, and I think those are the kind of skills you need now. Like those are the skills that schools should be teaching, not necessarily the technical skills, it's the understanding how to learn. Absolutely, and we don't spend any time on that and that's like like I think about when I have kids what I'm going to make sure they understand and above all it's going to be how to assimilate and process and and um, I guess scrutinize data and information and learn because if you can teach a person how to learn 
uh, you've done a great thing. And, you know, instead of you know teach, giving them a fish, you've taught them how to fish. They'll never starve a day in their life. Hundred mm-hmm. percent, and that's I. I can see that kind of mindset very much with you, because obviously, like I sort of said before, you know, you've done so many different things, but like you kind of then said, it's all the same. It's all learning. It's all overcoming challenges. So you know, you learn that skill. Yeah, it, it's all yeah, it's all the same thing. You know, um, it, there's nothing. It, people think it's that it's different, but to me, it's all the same. And and I think that's probably one of the things that's helped me uh, always. Uh, it's helped me in my approach because I I consider it all the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mindset for approach to chess is the same as it is for boxing, is the same as it is for writing, is the same as it is for school, is the same as it was for getting off alcohol. Like it's always been that same mindset, you know. So. That's uh, that's pretty much how I feel about it, and and how I look at it. That's one kind of trend that I'm noticing with like really successful people is they just kind of do different things that seem really different, but in reality for them, like you've kind of just perfectly explained, it's just overcoming challenges using your mindset and your skills to then learn and overcome different challenges. Um, I know some people do it to sort of keep their life exciting, to you know, give them a bit of extra, you know, extra variation. Uh, so what was it for you? You know, what was it that made you want to jump from challenge to challenge? Why not just keep pushing down one path, trying to overcome that challenge? Ah, uh, man, I can't. I'm, I, I can't be boring. There's, a, there's certainly an element of vanity. Um, mm-hmm. I would not be honest if I if I said it was all oh, just for the pursuit. Nah, after that, man. Like because I can. If I just wanted to have a, a good life, you know. Uh, figure out how to make a hundred thousand dollars, and that's it. And not even that much. I would, I would pretty much, I live like a bum, hang out, um, and get it set. But, but I don't want that. It just so happens that money is a byproduct of of challenging yourself and developing and growing skills, and and that's cool. You know, like I like feeling like I'm an intelligent, capable person. Uh, and these these uh, things I do, they help me attain that feeling. It's a good talk. Hmm. So that's uh that's pretty much how that goes, you know, like like in terms of, you know, my motivation, my my drive, it it really is just to be a better version of myself because that guy's cool and I like being cool. <laughs> I agree, no, it makes complete sense. Uh you mentioned you were learning a language. What language are you learning? Uh, I'm spending a lot of time on Spanish, man. I thought I knew it before, and now I'm, I'm realizing how little I know. <laughs> and it's it's a great time. Um, it's uh, you know when you when you when you learn a language. Here's what I'm experiencing in y'all. Uh, when you learn a language, you, you're you're really working on on many different things. One, you're working on uh, your memory. You're accumulating a lot of new vocabulary but but it's working it's not like, it's like a fact you accumulate you know you, you store in your mind you've got to know how to say it and how to use it and there's a big deal because if you say it incorrectly with the like the accent off but like i spent yesterday going through this this little difference the word for army and exercise uh very similar in, in spanish a hercito and a hercito and those are those are two different words like like even even something basically as basic as you know como esta and como esta, like it, those are two different words based on the accent. Okay, how this versus how are you? Um, but you're learning how that works, and then you're learning how to hear it from the words, and then use it in context, uh, which is changing your mind when you do that. You know, like I was reading this article about boxing. Uh, and that's what I do. I read a lot of articles about boxing and chess. Because those are the things I'm interested in. So, so I'm accumulating a vocabulary much faster, uh, even vocabulary that's not specifically related to the topic. And so I'm listening. Or not listening. I'm reading. And, and they they say you know say Rovio, what do they say? Say Rovio, boxeador, profesionales, uh, gang. And I'm like, okay, because when you look at that by itself, just break it down. He returned to professional boxing, but it was he. He became. I'm like, okay, so yeah, so that's how we use that. So now I gotta know that's how we use that. And so when I hear it, my brain's gotta think that, 
and, and it's weird when you learn a language you 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 you, you learn how connected and fast your brain is especially when you get to the point where you can hold more than like three senses in your mind <laughs> at once uh, which is like when people learn another language that that's like the challenge they hear something spoken and they can't understand it but when you can't understand it, the next challenge is then understanding it quickly enough to know what's being said 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 and you realize how fast that is our brains are incredible mm-hmm. like really powerful tools and it's a good time and I'm really happy I'm doing it good good how did you decide on Spanish was it just that that was the most uh, pr- 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 well, well it was the it was the one I felt I had like because I was you know interested here and there and a lot of stuff I like to watch and enjoy is in Spanish places I want to go are in Spanish you know Colombia I just get back from Mexico uh, so I'd rather I've been to Colombia I just get back from Mexico I've always wanted to see Buenos Aires if then, then COVID happened, but you know, mm-hmm. soon. And so, a lot of places I want to go speak Spanish. And then, on top of that, um, once you learn one romance language, your brain now is more attuned to learn the rest of them. And I experienced a little of that when I lived in Portugal with the bit of Spanish I did know. It was just like, like all the, stru- the structures and wording just made sense, and the, the pronunciation just changed. So, Learning Spanish is going to give me access to French, Romanian, Italian, and even more, more Portuguese. So there's that. And then, one, and then once I have that, then I'll probably switch to a um, uh, Slovak language. I want to learn Russian because I know they use uh, it's a, it's a widely spoken language, but they use but they think differently than English speakers, than and they think differently than Romance language speakers. So it'll be interesting to see how that that language uh, pushes my brain to work. Hmm. Definitely. Yeah, it sounds really good. So you kind of just chose it based on what you want from life, almost, because I know that's a big thing for a lot of people, choosing what language they actually want to speak. Yeah, um, and, and for me, it just makes... So if I'm going to learn a language, you know, there's some vanity, I like to be able to like use it in front of people, mm-hmm. and I like to be able to use it in general. Uh, and so Spanish is the most sensible one to learn right now for my life. Once I'm done with that, and, and, and the way I'm learning, I think by the summer, I think well, I'll be at a point where I'm like, okay, for me to get better at this language, I'd have to, the, the marginal utility will be gone, so I'll probably switch to something else. Mm-hmm. Uh, or rather, the marginal utility will, will like be decreasing. Uh, and in other words, like for me to, so like the goal in, in terms of the European uh, framework for languages, I want to be a B2 proficiency. That's pretty good. That's going to get me everywhere I need to go, allow me to watch a lot of TV, um, stuff like that. Right now, I'm like B1, which is this. It's annoying because B1 is like, I like, and, and I think overall I'm there. Like, I, I can speak and talk and use stuff and understand stuff, but I want more. Once, but once I get to B2 and I'm like firmly there and I feel good, I'm, I'll, I'll be like, all right, I'm done. Like, studying formally. Because at that point, like to get the C one is like conversational. Like if you're a C one in English, you're basically a native speaker. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fair enough. So once you get to that point, you can basically then go to these Spanish countries, engage in conversation, and learn that way. Yeah, like I could do that now, you know, it, which is which is great. But I, I'd like to do it to a larger degree. Mm-hmm. Like like there are real limitations I run into that I'm that I'm like ironing out right now. My my language learning stuff I didn't think about or know. Yeah, yeah that's fair. Will we be seeing uh, books and articles written in Spanish by you then in the future? Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, what was, what's great about that is that the, uh, the, Span- the, the, the Latin America loves boxing. It's, it's, it's much bigger mm-hmm. in Latin America than it is in, in North America. Um, no, nah, but I think it'll open up some doors. Maybe, you know, uh, there's a thing, you know, once, once you know one, you know, you, you, you kind of get exposed to a bunch of other stuff. Mm, 100%, 100%. 100%. So, yeah, okay, that sounds good. I look forward to seeing it at some point in the future. Um, you mentioned your boxing career then. Am I correct in saying you had a record of 13-1-1? Very nice. That's obviously very good. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that's uh, correct. Yeah, that's obviously a very good record. Uh, how did you actually get into boxing? Uh, you know, when I was 22, my, um, I was, you know, just in a mess of a place of life, 
and I needed something to focus and channel my energies around. So I said, let me start boxing. Um, and and I like I wanted something that had some sweat equity, you know, to show, and, and I wanted to try something out. So I went in, and my attitude was, you know, I'm gonna be as I'm gonna get as good as I can. And that's what happened. I, I just kept sticking around, kept learning, kept kept making incremental progress, and and pretty soon it, it became the thing uh, that I am I'm kind of known for, I guess, or done a lot with. I mean, here's the thing: I haven't fought, and you know, it'll be four years uh, this December. I haven't fought in the ring, and and that still opens doors for me, and I'm I'm amazed by that. Because it is a very difficult thing. I mean, I think back on the life that I lived when I was doing it. It was a hard life, you know. Not not something that. Um, would, would I do it all over again if I had to start now? No way. Uh, would I do it all over again if I was 22? Yeah, maybe. I'd start again. I'd be like, yeah, yeah, why not? <laughs> you know. So. It's a, uh, it's it's a good, but it's hard. There's no money. You beat up. You're poor usually, which means no health insurance, and that's a totally different risk you're taking. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, I'm I'm fortunate. I'm, I'm I'm fortunate that I've had a good, I've had a good career and a good time and a good life. Mm. You know, so. So uh, that's a uh, but. but No, I was gonna say, you know, that that's from from just from boxing, man. I am, uh, um, I if you let it change you, it'll change you. If you let it, if you, if you let it develop you, if you, if you go with the flow, you okay. know, that is, um, that's where I am with it and, and how it how it's happened. So, um. I don't know if how I, I, I you know it's where I can't imagine my life not having done it now. Like I don't know what I would have done otherwise, um, because it is such a defining part of who I am and how I think. Mm -hmm. What made you kind of get into boxing specifically? Because uh, is it just kind of because it was there and it was kind of the most popular? Yeah, I was you know I was oh I was the, I had to, I had my choice for the first year of fighting I did. All of fight I did MMA, kickboxing, BJJ, everything, and eventually I went with boxing because that's what my body type was. Um, it, 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 and that's what the most sparring was at the time for me at that body type as well. Uh, I, you know, could I have done done good things in you know uh, MMA? Maybe, maybe not. I don't have a wrestling background or anything like that, so so I don't know. But what I do know is is uh, boxing just the, I, I enjoy the culture of boxing too. Boxing has got a got a more distinguished old line lineage. Uh, you know, MMA will be there one day, but boxing is old. Like <laughs> it, it's it, it's in the Olympics. Like there's a real there's stories and movies. It's it's really interesting. There's a there's a real culture behind it that doesn't exist yet in MMA, and I really enjoyed that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Like I say, MMA has only been around a short time, but it's definitely one of those things that's going to get there eventually. But yeah, boxing, you know, that's been around since caveman, caveman periods, if I, if I remember correctly. So yeah, it's been there a long time. Uh, well, yeah, it was the old Greek Olympics. I mean, like, there is. Mm. But it's fun. Mm. Yeah, no, it's. What are your thoughts on the kind of Greek physique? Because like, obviously, you know, you've got like still got like the Greek statues. For me, when I look at that, that I'm like, that's the kind of physical sort of sharpness I want. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think I, I've never been a big workout for Vanity God, believe it or not. Um, every time I try, I just can't keep the motivation up because I don't. And, and, and I think part of it is because my introduction to training most of my life, for most of my life, I've trained for functionality. Mm -hmm. And that just happened to come with being, you know, aesthetically pleasing. 
but if if you're going to you know do it, I mean, I, I think I think that's a worthwhile, and worthy goal. I think I think you can go go pretty far, you know, like that. I think you can do if you, if you get, end up looking pretty nice, uh, and, and you you get a lot of advantages being in shape. There's no there are no disadvantages to being in shape. Mm, exactly. So like I'm, you know, I'm obviously like I'm doing home workouts at the moment because of you know COVID shutting down all the gyms and stuff, um, and like I'm already seeing the advantages even if it's just from energy levels because if you're physically fit you can you know work more, work harder, stay focused, um, and just enjoy the work more is what I'm finding. Yeah, it, it's good. You know, I, I wish. Well, I think one of the the tragedies is that we 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 have. Education mandatory, compulsory, but we don't have physical fitness mandatory, mm. and that it, that that shows. And it's not even real education. It's 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 awful though. But like, yeah, imagine if they had you know working out like mandatory, like you had to achieve a certain, you know, you had to have a certain body fat, a certain BMI, you know, like. And I'm not even saying like it has to be like some crazy, but just to stand national standard, what that would do. We have it for mm. education. Mm. So. Yeah, hundred percent. That would definitely, I mean, not eradicate it, but it would definitely massively reduce the obesity epidemic that's sort of taking over at least the Western world at this point in time. Yeah. Sort of just hold but people like, to standard fitness. So. Yeah, but you know that right, but that will require people to to, to maintain themselves. It's crazy. Mm. Yeah, true. Um, I kind of think though, if you sort of put put it in place, so let's say take body fat percentage. You know, you say you have to be at the average, the national standard of body fat percentage or below when you finish school, for example. I think if you gave them that foundation of fitness, it's easy to keep in shape once you are in shape because you've developed the mindset yep. to go with it. Right, it would be right, but when people end up coming up with these with these terrible habits, and and it's just it, that's why you get a chance. That that's why I'm such a big component or I'm a big fan of homeschooling mm-hmm. because you you get to because this system is just broken and busted. And I've always been a fan of homeschooling, and and now you know you just can't you just can't like if if you let this system teach your children. You're just like, what are you? What are you doing? You know, <laughs> like, like they don't they don't teach real education, real socialization. It is it's just a mess. Um, so it's a waste of time. It's, it's a waste of time and energy. Mm, I agree. So, it's obviously I've very recently come out of this education system, and like the stuff that I'm using now, the skills I'm using now, and actually you know making successes from. I learned none of these in school. Yeah, it's 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 weird, you know. It's it's even from a from a an academic standpoint, there is almost nothing you will learn. Like if your job is to like you want to do some academic, they they're gonna start you on on the math and and science in college, but they gotta do something with all these kids, right? So you got to put them somewhere during the day, and that's what school is. And you got to give them stuff to distract them. I mean, it's just, it's it's amazing how ridiculous the system is. And once you wake up to it, here's the worst part. Even if you wake up to it, or rather, I'll, I'll say this. There's a vested interest in staying asleep to it, because if you stay asleep to it, uh, the, you don't have to acknowledge how foolish it is, and you don't have to acknowledge how difficult it is to break free from that system. Because, like, at the end of the day, you have to work and feed yourself. If you can't do that, uh, it doesn't matter what system your child's in, because because it ain't gonna be yours anymore for much longer. You're gonna be broken and destitute, and you know the state will step in. So, if you um, if you look at it though, and you realize. Like, I'd imagine that's a really rough place to be in where you realize how silly and ridiculous the system is, but you can't pull your children out of it without a kind of serious economic hardship. But the type of people uh, who are to, who are going to recognize that uh, don't tend to make decisions to keep them from 
taking advantage of it. So there, there, there are my thoughts on that. I think it's it's a it's a crazy system. I think it's um the, the more I think about it, I was thinking about this last night at Ali Mode. Um, the more I think about how uh, how much I mean brainwash because you, you got to get where you got to be. You got to rely on the system. You got to think it's going to make a difference. You, you gotta you gotta lean on it. So um, that's uh, what they need to happen and if, and if you make it happen um, <laughs> uh, then then you're going to keep society going because at the end of the day kind of the worst thing for society is that if everyone goes holy hell this is this is a farce um, then society will collapse great for the individual but after the collective and that that's a balance that one must always consider definitely I think society as a whole as well obviously a lot of individuals and then society as a whole are kind of becoming more woke to say about the fact that the sort of standard traditional education system is just wrong and i think to a degree covid has sort of aided that as well because like at my university i don't know how it is in america but in the united kingdom like my university right now all of our lectures are online and they're using a lot of resources that we have access to for free so then a lot of my friends and like other students are kind of sitting there thinking, well, why am I paying like 10 grand a year for something right. like on my own? Ex oh, man. There's this whole thing. Uh, this one positive, maybe, but I, I doubt it. People don't want to wake up because that, that uh, it's responsibility. You can't be awake and irresponsible. Or rather, you can't be awake and blame uh, things. You got to go, you know, okay, what is... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, let's pretend this all goes back to normal. But what am I paying for? Whoa, whoa, whoa. They're not going to do that. I say all the time. The university system is not going anywhere because too many people rely on it. They need it. They want it. They don't want to. They like. They don't want to figure this thing out on their own. They want people to tell them what to do. So, what do you think would have to happen for the collapse of the university system and the educator system, education system, as it is? Oh, a wolf. I think that'll be one of the last things to go, if it ever goes. Because we've always had it, right? There's always been a, a direction of putting someone through the higher education. What, what, what's, so, that, so that in and of itself, like a higher level of education, it is not mandatory, but is uh, optional. I don't think that's going to go anywhere. What may happen is, you know, I see Google is is required is now going to make, you know, certifications and you pay for those certifications. Oh, you take the test and then you can get that. So okay, that could happen. Employers going, we don't, you know, we we need we need skills and the university is not matching those skills. But that's what will happen when 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 it is economically no longer feasible when the universities no longer provide the product. And it's costing employers. Because at the end of the day, businesses drive it. It ain't education, right? Uh, and, and the only reason college is so expensive, well, not only, there are a few, but one of the biggest reasons college is so expensive is because employers demand. So, so they know with that demand, they can supply it at a higher price. But if employers start going, we don't care. Uh, we need X, Y, and Z ability. We don't care about degrees anymore we want to test your ability that then you know then something might give because enrollments are going to go down enrollments are already down hmm. you know but in a lot of places i've seen a lot of colleges kind of close even locally a lot of smaller ones because people are like well, what's the point hmm. definitely and i i genuinely do believe in in 30 years we're going to see this shift because you see you know big business owners take elon musk for example he is a big big fan of like you said Basing employment on ability, not a degree, um, and you know, but even Bill yeah. Gates, who obviously comes from an era where degrees were kind of required, he's even turned around and said, "But we want skills, not degrees." Um, and I think we're seeing this yeah. more and more. Yeah, because at the end of the day, the business, the, the business goes like like that worked when the world was in a an interesting uh, middle. It was not quite. 
completely out of the industrial. Well, well and then will it ever really be? No, because you got to build stuff. But we were kind of this like office glut, middle class idea. Now with the middle class, it's, it's been interesting experiment that popped up, but that's never been a thing in history. Like, and in those, in most societies, that doesn't happen. What happens is you have people who, who figured out how to get some stuff, and the people who ain't got it, and there's like other classes, like military or whatever. Um, but what I was going to say is that uh, when, now that, that the world is so tech heavy, and it's so, like, like, the universities can't even catch up to the education required to do things. So, like, like well, you know, like, what good is it, are, are most of the degrees going to do short of uh, if you want to go into higher ed? And, or you want to go on and pursue, like, actual research and try to make a difference. But if, you just, if you're paying 50 k for a degree and you're trying to get a job and they're, and they're hiring people without degrees, you wasted your money. You wasted your time. You know? So that that's gonna change a lot, and then it'll be employer driven. It won't be people are not gonna rise up. Uh, it'll be employer driven. I'm just like I need this. Like I need this, and they're not giving me that. Mm, definitely, so, it's like when you look at it from from that perspective of you know they're hiring people without degrees. If we assume, you know, if you're spending 50 grand on a university degree, the way I'm kind of looking at it is, imagine you spent that 50 grand on courses and self-development <laughs> and gym memberships and all of these different things. Like, imagine how much further you'd be ahead. Uh, so much. and But, but you'd be out the system. Mm. <laughs> you know? Like, like when I'm... Um, like, I think about what it, what it means, like, just right now, basically being in the shape I'm in at my age. And I, I don't think I'm in, like, super great shape, but I am in way above average shape for mm -hmm. some of my age. And, and it's like, I don't know, I'm looking at people, and I'm just like, man, you're so sickly and weak. Like, what are you, like, and, and it's, it's like they're in the matrix. Or I think about, like, I don't, I'm not super rich, but my income is all derived from my efforts and my presence, my internet stuff, and when I'm like, I don't, I'm not sitting here going, oh goodness, uh, I'm not worried about like a lot of day to day stuff. There's no, I don't need to devote energy. That's stressful. So why would I do that? You know. And so it frees your mind to think about things and solve problems and to enjoy your life when you when you break out of the system. And and one part of being in a system is being reliant on the devices of the system, like. Education. Mm. Yeah, 100%. It's once you've got that kind of, you know, once you've got enough to let, you know, like say, cover your bills, cover your living costs, once you've got the skills you need to just basically you know, provide, um, you're, you're physically fit enough that you don't need to be going to the hospital every month or every you know, couple of times a year. Once you get that, like say, you don't become reliant on that system, you can live independently. You're basically your own system, which I really like the idea of. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Like it's, uh, it's, it's a little, but people don't. I mean, I, I'm convinced that people don't don't want it for a variety of reasons. You know, um, that responsibility is a real mf for man. You got to be really responsible, and you have to, um, you have to work. Work and responsibility come hand in hand. A lot of people don't want to want to deal with that burden. That's a, that's a heavy. No, it's a battle that I think we've seen. You know, you've seen it for you know, in books since the beginning of time. You've seen it in films like I mean, look at one of the sort of more recent films like Star Wars. You know, it's the battle between the more difficult but you know good Jedi, and then you've got like the real like easy seductive path of the Sith. And it's like you've kind of got constantly got to make that decision. Do you want to make it easy and seductive, and you know, fine, it's it's easy, but you don't get any real fulfillment out of it or you can go down the harder route and it's sure it's difficult but you know you will like yourself as a person you'll build a life that you love you'll have the freedom to choose what it is you spend your life doing and not be in this kind of toxic cycle that the system is yeah and and that's a great feeling it's a great freedom mm -hmm. more person ever reaches 
bad Japan, so, <laughs> you know. So, so we 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 will see kind of how, you know where people are gonna go with that, but I don't I don't think it'll ever it'll ever happen. You know? I, I don't think anything will ever cause a collapse because people don't want to collapse. What they want is more stability. Yeah. And things collapse when they're unstable. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> Hey, no matter what the cost of that stability, people want that stability. So there, there's that to think about, and that I don't think that'll ever change. Yeah, I suppose you know you've got to think there's a reason that there's a one percent, because if everybody had that kind of mindset, it wouldn't be the one percent; it would be the you know the one hundred percent, wouldn't it? So yeah, but it, but it would change the it w- it would change the world, you know. Mm-hmm. But but is it gonna is it gonna change? I think because I've I've you know I'm by no means perfect at all, and I'm by no means like the best at this. But there's people in my life, mostly in the past of my life, where I would give them advice. You know, even if it's just simple advice, like you know, get up and make your bed, basically. You know, just simple stuff. Um, and I'd give them this advice, and no matter how many times you give them this advice, no matter how many times you try and help them, they just don't act on it. Um, so it's like these people don't want to be helped. And they just want that, like say, that comfortability, that stability of what they know, even if what they know is wrong or bad for them. Yeah. Um, to that, I'll say, you know, people. I, I think people, people, are very bad at pursuing the long play because the long play takes a lot of energy mm-hmm. and a, a high investment. And it's not necessarily enjoyable. So of course people don't don't you know when when what what is best for a person usually doesn't <laughs> uh, line up with what feels best for a person. Yeah. So that that that's a big problem right there, and and so uh, people aren't going to ever make that change because that gets rid of their ability to kind of seek out and enjoy stuff mm. yeah it's uh, right. it's all about like delayed gratification and instant gratification if you're getting instant gratification and you know you can keep getting pleasure enjoyment happiness from just doing what you want in that moment why are you going to give that up to then make life hard for yourself yeah uh, <laughs> well, so that's the other thing too man life is easy you, you really got to work that hard to have mm. something cool and good not really uh, you, you you go quite far with with, with not a lot. Mm. Um, and so if you if you want more, it's it, it's something unique that drives you. Um, something different. Not you like you know you you know it's, it's meme says you you built differently. Yeah. Um, you're pursuing something greater. Yeah, this is this is one thing that kind of really shocked me almost when I sort of started getting into like the self improvement uh, area of Twitter, like money Twitter, um, is how easy it is to be better than average like i was working in yep. something it was so difficult to like be better than average but no if you spend an hour a day working on skills you're better than average instant like within like a month you're better than average yeah because most people don't, don't do that because skills take a long time to materialize mm-hmm. and show up and there's a lot of difficulty and, and failure and some embarrassment but but um Netflix is quick. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, sports is quick. You can watch that. You know, internet is quick. Mm-hmm. It's. So. I think that's. This is one of the reasons that obviously, kind of, a bit in the future, I'm excited to have kids and teach them skills from you know a super young age because then obviously I've been learning skills like these for the last few years and I'm further ahead than most people I speak to, um, at least at my age anyway. And I'm excited to sort of have kids and then teach these kids these skills, you know, from really young ages. Because by the time they get to 20, they're not going to have a few years under their belt. They're going to have like, you know, 10, even 15 years of learning and developing skills. And I think if people, like you said, like with self, uh, with home education, sorry, if you can kind of ingra- ingrain these skills as part of that, I think the future generation will be ridiculously powerful. 
Yeah. Yeah, it, it will. But but and I'm all, I'm talking to some guys who have well, not to, I have I have some friends who have, um, you know, kids and they're raising them in this way, and then they're they're gonna be way ahead of the curve, but most people aren't. So so we're just gonna see another distribution. Yeah. Uh, where where a few people have all the power, <laughs> or a lot crazy, of power, yeah. and, a, and a lot of people complain that they don't, and that's just a part of human nature and kind of how it's always been unfortunately mm. yeah i suppose i suppose it kind of has to be like that almost like you you always with everything you need balance if you don't have that balance then you know you either have too many people at the top and it sort of all becomes just like some ruthless battle or you have too many people at the bottom and society can't grow or grow yeah yeah no yeah that's um I, I think I've always said that I think uh, after a certain like baseline that inequality is a uh, is a feature not a bug of of society mm-hmm. and that that it's always going to work the way like people's ambition is not distributed evenly you know we're not we're not all the same level of ambition the same level of work I think that even we have the same interests uh, and the things we're interested in are not going to be are rewarded equally so that with, with that said you know it's just not um, going to matter uh, no matter what we try to introduce and every time we try to introduce a system to kind of kind of fix this I communism and to a lesser degree socialism uh, we, we get horrific results because that is that is battling the natural distribution of humanity. People just gotta <laughs> top it up. If you want more, you can go get more, kinda. Um, but you can't make everyone equal. That that never works out well. No, I think the I think the solution, or you know, the the right way to do this is equality of opportunity. And I think at the moment, there's a lot of people in society trying to push for equality of outcome, and that just it doesn't work out well for anybody. Yeah, um, and and people think it will. It, it, like it's similar to the um, raising minimum wage argument. If you raise minimum wage, uh, then what do you do with the people one who make less than it, but well, and they're appropriately paid, right? Uh, everyone thinks that their wages are something on the raise. Like, no, they're gonna be fired. Like, that's that's usually what happens. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and then people don't understand that because, well, like, like in other words, like when you when you raise the price of what you gotta pay people, if, if it's not built to the either that or the prices are gonna go up, and all of a sudden everyone's gonna be like, yo, why is the place so expensive? They don't realize that. Like when you raise the minimum wage law, it it hurts small business owners. It doesn't it doesn't like. Like, could Walmart pay people more? Probably, right? And they're not feeling anything. But, but you know who can't? Your, your local store. Your local pizza shop. Your local restaurant. Like, those people can't do that. And so, uh, what, what, they're, what they're targeting and what, what they want isn't necessarily what they think they want. <laughs> you know? And they don't find that out until it's too late. See, one idea that I kind of... I'm not 100% sure how kind of plausible it'd be or how good it would be, but one idea I've kind of had in the past just when I'm discussing it with like friends um, is if you got rid of minimum wage, obviously you would have some businesses that pay a very good minimum wage just kind of by default, and you would have other businesses that pay peanuts. Right, which that point, is what I've always said. People would then stop yeah. working for, stop paying the companies that don't pay a good minimum wage because they don't agree with it and they would pay more to companies that do pay a good minimum wage and by automatically you know these companies that aren't paying as much would then pay more so they become one of these companies that are paying a fair minimum wage that's kind of how i think that's the best system possible yeah you know i've always said that that i that when you think about it counterintuitively the best solution is to have no minimum wage but Mm -hmm. People ain't trying to hear that because it's fear. People are afraid, and so and, and that is a terrifying solution. Yeah, because it removes that safety like, net. Um, yep. But if some of that, then they don't want that. They don't want to deal with that. So, but that will likely never happen. But it, it's it's certainly a great uh, thought experiment. 
yeah, no, I, I like I say, it's it's a good idea. I just don't think, like you say, I don't think it'll ever happen. It's just kind of one of those things that's too out there for most people to accept. It be, need to be something that's gradually worked up towards, and it requires a complete mental shift in pretty much everyone. So, yeah. So you know, we we still we still see, but but you know, probably. Uh, oh no, we just see. I mean, I'm I'm convinced the the world is kind of you know set about it's it's just you know we we can we can break it down and analyze it and and it's interesting in the regard, but but you know changes they probably aren't gonna you know show up anytime soon <laughs> because there won't be changes because people because yeah. people are people. It's easy, like you've said, it's easier to just follow what is than to try and change it to what could be. Absolutely. So while we're on the kind of topic of kind of you know learning from a young age and sort of like you know, working on your mindset, I was I grew up without a father present, and I know that you also grew up without a father present, and that's come with its own set of challenges. You know, you've not really had someone that you can kind of look up to, learn from, develop mindset from so what is your advice to young guys girls just young people in general who maybe don't have a parental figure or you know some sort of you know, yeah some sort of parental figure that they can sort of look up to learn from uh you know you you have to um find those you have to you, you you're gonna be uh you're gonna be beating i uh, beating you're gonna be um building yourself up. It's, it's, uh, and, and it's not going to be easy so the thing is going to be easy is, is pointless um, just, but just know that it, it's part of the necessary work you know you don't you don't get around it because uh, or you don't you don't forfeit it no one's going to care if you don't have that influence you have to figure out how to make that influence yourself you know <laughs> so that's, that's kind of you know what a lot of what I did with Fighting with my life, with with all the things I try to expose myself to, is I said that you know no one's gonna give me anything. Um, let me let me figure this out on my own. You know, it's not that no one's gonna help me. There's nothing out there that, that's gonna do anything like that. So let me let me do this on my own. And that's what you gotta do. I mean, you, you gotta you gotta figure it out. You have to go. You have to yourself um, and shape yourself mm. it's just uh, what happens and if you can do that and then if you can do that um, you can you can, or rather you can do that in a variety of ways you can do it in, uh, sports is really a great great field to do it uh, the way it is now and how you know uh, hopefully you pick the right sport that trains you If you're learning, if you're in good competition, like you got to be, competition is good. You know that's one of the things that the, the guys miss. They miss the, they miss competition. They miss being forced to learn under, under a tough circumstance. They miss getting tough love, and that's what competition does for you. And that's what you. If you can get if you can get competition and learn to cope with it and then to develop the responsibilities and the personality that will allow you to excel in said competition, I think that's one of the best things uh, a young man can do. Hmm. I was discussing this with a good friend of mine actually yesterday, and we were sort of talking about the idea that you know you don't necessarily it's not about it's not just about what you expose yourself to it's kind of it's kind of who you expose yourself to so if you can build a network of people that you respect that have the life that you want um, and that are kind of sharing their mindset you can kind of easily you can pick that up from them even if you're you know let, let's say your father left or you know maybe your your friends that you're kind of having to spend time around at school and university maybe don't have that um, and sports as you said is a great way of doing that yeah absolutely no real 
uh, you know, World Sub Fort. I mean, yeah, let's put it like this: sports are so great uh, that even even um, people with their father around, you know, they they do even better, you know. Mm-hmm. So that's um, what I would what I recommend. And, and sports is unique compared to other forms of competition because because it forces you to be in, in a in pain that like you have to that that is real visceral like you're hurting you have to conquer and do what other guys learn how to deal with losing like like those physical effects are very really unique and if you can get those down you're gonna be in good shape. Yeah, hundred percent, man. Okay, right. Last question, then. So you've achieved so much, and you're only thirty-five. You know, you've like you say, you've lived four different lives. You've achieved so much. You've got so much success. I'm kind of curious. How do you manage your time? Like, how do you structure your days to, you know, keep on track of things? Oh man, you know? my time is terrible. I'm a lot for a time management. <laughs> uh, what I have is I have. I mean, I have a few priorities, and I make sure I. I make always you know doing a different like interview or uh some stuff in my daily life but whenever i get the time i, I just you know do it I, I have my priorities set and i try and, and try and work towards it as long as you have your priorities uh time management tends to figure itself out you know uh the problem is when people don't have priorities like i, I don't need a, a super detailed schedule because uh, i have my priorities you know, i look at my whiteboard i see what i've got to work on at any given time and there's, and there's never a free moment, you know. So it's it's just um, that's what I do. I don't I know what I want and I, I work towards it. And I don't really try and get caught up in anything else. I think if you do that, you know, you, you're gonna be all right. I mean, some people have other demands, so perhaps that advice isn't isn't great for them. But for me. I have, you know, my two or three priorities that I know I got to get done and what I'm interested in working on, and that's it. Mm. I, I can definitely see that. Like, I've recently started a business, and one of the first lessons I've had to learn is spend your time working on what's important. Because, like, when I first started, I was really busy, but I was busy doing a lot of the wrong things. So then once you get those priorities framed in your mind, that's when you can kind of work smart, work hard, and really make moves. Yeah, and and that'll it, it really leverages because when you when you get something done, it's done, and that's cool. It really stands on its own as a piece of work. That's one thing that I've I've learned from from writing and blogging. Like, yeah, it may take a little while to get an article done, or at least or it's not done as as quickly as you want it to be. But once you have it finished, then you are you have a thing that continues to draw on revenue, draw on odds, like like it all is, is really kind of awesome what happens when, when you get stuff done but you gotta make sure you get stuff done you know mm-hmm. so yeah okay that sounds good right well that's it for me, do you have anything else that you wanted to sort of ask or discuss while you're here? No, man, this has been awesome, man. I really uh, appreciate you having me on. It's been a good time, and and I wish nothing but the best for you. Thank you. I appreciate you coming on. Obviously, it's been, you know, I've been following you on Twitter for a few years at this point. You know, I was way back before you even started doing your crackhead uh, tweets, Back way back before then. <laughs> um, I was back, you know, before the Coffee So Black tweets were coming out. Um, so yeah, wow. it's been it's it's like a almost like a dream of mine to have you come on and like yeah have a call with you have a discussion with you because you're a you know, really interesting knowledgeable guy so thank you. Well, man, I appreciate that, man. Uh, thank thanks again, and you know just let me know when it comes out. All right, we'll do. Uh, yeah, I'll send you. Uh, I'll, I'll send you all the uh, footage and stuff before I put it out, so you can have a look at it, um, and I'll obviously tag you and stuff. So. Uh, I'm gonna stop recording um, and end this, but I've got one more thing to ask you, just off the uh, off the air, if that's alright. Sure. Yeah. No problem, man. What's up?